Hi everyone, uh, my name is Leland Richardson. I'm a software engineer working on the Android UI toolkit at Google. Uh, more specifically, I work on Jetpack Compose, and today I'm going to talk to you about the Compose compiler and the Compose runtime. So uh, I'm kind of curious, brief show of hands, how, how many of you before this conference had heard of Compose? <laughs> All right. How many of you had used Compose? OK, cool. All right, well, it's not everybody. So uh, let's first start by going over um, what Compose is kind of at a high level. So first and foremost, Compose is a declarative runtime geared towards UI development. And it's 100% written in Kotlin. And interestingly, C Compose requires a Kotlin compiler plugin. And this is a lot about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so there'll be more on that later. It's built by the Android UI Toolkit team. So this is the same team that uh, currently maintains the, the existing UI Toolkit. And it's, it's a complete ground up rewrite, uh, a reimagining of, of what a UI framework on Android uh, would look like, and, and um, especially in a declarative way. And critically, it's, it's unbundled uh, from the Android operating system. So it's, it's a user space library, and that allows us to ship out of band updates. Um, and it means that if you want to use Compose, you don't have to wait for OEMs to, to adopt new features from, from OS releases. And also, it's open source. So, so this is kind of a, a cool thing. So we're, we're developing all of Compose completely out in the open. Uh, and these are live commits. And so you can go and check out, uh, look at the source, contribute, um, understand how things work, things like that. And importantly, it, it's really, really early. So Compose right now is uh, what we call a developer preview. And what that means is that there's still big chunks missing. Uh, there, there's still things that uh, we have yet to do. And there's still a lot of fundamental changes that we're likely to make before it uh, becomes production ready. So OK, as I mentioned, Compose is a declarative UI runtime. And uh, it's also a Kotlin compiler plugin. And so you might see this and think, well, why do we need a Kotlin compiler plugin to just build a UI library? That, that seems like a pretty uh, big leap there. There should be a pretty high bar to actually go in and touch the compiler uh, to build something like this. And so um, th this is going to be a lot of what I talk about. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll understand a little bit more about what we're doing with this compiler plugin and why. And so th this is maybe a good time for me to uh, just give a few caveats about this talk. So I'm, I'm going to go over some pretty advanced topics today. And Really, the, the, the goal is to go over these with um, uh, the, the goal to have it be fairly approachable to, to people who don't understand or work in this type of environment every day. At least that's the hope. And additionally, I'm going to talk about a lot of implementation details. So these are things that you don't necessarily need to understand in order to use Compose. Um, and, and more importantly, a lot of these things are liable to change. Um, and, and some of the things that I'm talking about aren't actually done yet. And so these are sort of planned things. And, and so just keep that in mind. <clears throat> OK, so first, let's go over what we mean when we say declarative. Uh, Compose is a declarative UI runtime, but, but what does that actually mean? And usually when we talk about declarative, we're, we're talking about it in the context uh, or in contrast to something being imperative. And so let, let's go over what that uh, is by, by means of an example. So let's consider we have a, an application. It has some sort of a unread messages icon. And so in this application, what we want to do is we want to say, OK, if there are no unread messages, just an envelope. And if there are some unread messages, we show a paper and a badge. And then we're going to do something a little bit cute. If you've got over 100 unread messages, we're going to render some fire on it. So how would we implement this in an imperative uh, UI framework? It might look something like this. So this is completely platform agnostic. This is just 
uh, you know, pseudocode. But what you would do in an imperative system is you might write a function that, that takes in uh, the new count. And then what it does is it looks at the current state of the UI. And it, it checks to see what, it, what that is and then what it should be. And then it makes some changes a, as a result of those things. And so you actually have to go through all these different cases and, and make sure that you're adding and removing and updating all the right things. And so this fairly simple example actually ends up uh, with kind of error-prone code. It's very, uh, very complicated. And in reality, it might actually even be more complicated than that. Sometimes what we need to do is we need to separate the initialization code uh, or, or sort of the first rendering from the updating code. So uh, doing the same thing in, in a declarative system might look something a little more like this. And so the idea here is, is that just like before, we have a function that, that, that's receiving a, a new count. Um, but in this case, the, the, the key difference is that we, we aren't actually looking at what the, the current state of the UI is. All, all we're saying is, given this count, here's what I want. So we OK, here, I want an envelope. And if count's greater than 99, show fire. If count's greater than 0, show paper. And then inside of it, we're going to render a badge if, if it's greater than 0, and it's going to have a count. <clears throat> so the, the kind of name of the game with a declarative UI system is that you want to describe what your UI should look like right now. But for any value of now, it needs to work for all of those things. And so what that means is that you write code that's independent of the previous state, even though it handles all of, uh, all of the states for all time. So going back to this example, let's sort of look at the anatomy uh, of this function. It receives count as data coming in. And we want to treat this data as, as immutable data. This is just a transform function of data coming in. Here's the UI that we produce out. And so here we're calling other composable functions, in this case, envelope and badge. And this represents our description of what the UI should look like as a result. And it's important to note that we're able to use any sort of language features that we normally would in, in any old function. And so here we're using uh, an if statement, for example. Um, but, but you're able to use other things like for loops or you know, any sort of utility functions or, or libraries that you're used to using inside of Kotlin. And then it's, it's also important to note that we're, we're leveraging Kotlin's trailing lambda syntax here. So envelope has a composable lambda parameter that we're, we're passing in at the end. And what we're doing is we're using that to uh, create some sort of an implicit structure in the UI. And so envelope here is semantically wrapping the badge that, that is being rendered inside of it. And then finally, we're annotating this function with at composable. And so from this example, it's not quite clear yet why this is necessary, um, but, but this, this annotation is, is what we use to indicate that it's one of these declarative functions. So I want to go in and, and talk about what this is actually doing. What, what, is, what does at composable actually mean? And what does it actually do? Why, why do we need it? And so to do that, I want to talk about at composable in contrast uh, or, or as an analogy to something else, which is the suspend language keyword. So the suspend keyword alters function types. And so you're able to use suspend in front of a function declaration. You're able to use it in front of a lambda declaration. Or you're able to use it on a, a function type. And at composable is, is able to be used in all of the same places in exactly the same way. And, and the important thing to understand here is that just like suspend, at composable is actually changing the type of that function. And so what, what that means, practically speaking, is that if you had uh, a composable unit lambda and you, you tried to pass it into a function that was expecting a unit lambda, it, it would not compile. The type system would complain because they're different types. The other thing to, uh, to think about is to suspend has the, this thing where you can't call a suspend function unless you're inside of a suspend function. And this is because uh, suspend functions require a calling context. There's an object that's passed around uh, through all of the suspend function calls. Uh, 
And it turns out that Composable has the same exact constraint for a very similar reason. We, we also pass around a context object. That, that means that you need to be inside of a Composable function in order to call one. So now let's go and look at the motivation for suspend. Here, here we have an example of uh, sequential asynchronous operations that we're trying to do without suspend. And what, what happens when we do something like this is that we have a bunch of nested lambdas that uh, create a, an environment where it's difficult for us to utilize uh, language, uh, language features like for and if, and it's difficult for us to follow the logic of what's happening. And it turns out that if you, if you turn it into something like this, it's a little bit easier to follow and maps closer to our mental model uh, of what's actually going on when, when we have sequential asynchronous operations. And so with, with Composable, there's a similar motivation, which is where we want to take uh, these types of functions that um, are, are mapping sort of uh, new, new data and, and updating um, UIs. What, what we want to do is we want to take this and essentially turn it into this. And so the way to think, or the way I like to think of suspend functions is that they're just like normal functions, except they have a few extra capabilities and semantics. So it, it's a normal function, except execution can pause and resume at any time. And while it's paused, the thread is unblocked. And so that creates a semantic difference from, from other functions that you might use, but you're still able to use them and think about them in a similar fashion. So composable functions in, in the same sort of framing are normal functions, except they have this extra capability, which is that there's a sort of memory of the last call at that position in the call graph. And additionally, a composable function can be re-invoked at any time. And so this first capability, this memory, I, uh, it's closely related to a concept that we call po positional memoization. And I'm going to go in and talk about exactly what that is. And then this ability to be re-invoked at any time is something that we call recomposition. And I'm going to talk about that as well. So looking at positional memoization, it's important to understand some of the data structures that we use for Compose. And, and in particular, that object that I was talking about, that calling context object that we pass around, uh, there's, there's a data structure in, inside of that object that we use that's very similar to a, a data structure known as a gap buffer. And most of you probably aren't familiar with gap buffers. They're, they're not very commonly used, but sometimes they're used in text editors. And so the, the data structure works something like this. Oh, and we, we call this data structure a slot table. So here we have our slot table. And uh, a slot table is basically a representation of a list. And this list is, is a list that has a current index. And in this case, we're representing this list as a flat array in memory. And so necessarily, that array is larger than the data that the list represents. And so the space in that array that is empty, we refer to as the gap. And so if we're passing this object around all of our composable functions, uh, as we're executing composable functions, we might be able to appeal to this, uh, to this data structure. And we're, we're able to store data into it. We can in insert data as we go along and execute. And then when we're done, at some later time, we may recompose that, that function, like I mentioned. And when we do that, what we want to do is we want to reset the current index to the same index that it was previously. And so now, as we execute the function again, we can choose to, to skip over data if we want, make no change, or we're able to update a piece of data if we'd like to. And then if the structure of execution has changed, what we can do is we can insert new data into, into that data structure. And when we do that, we move the gap to the current index. And then we're able to insert data in constant time. And so the, the key thing to kind of understand here is that all of the array operations that we've been talking about, so like get, insert, and remove, those are all constant time operations. The only thing that's not constant time is moving the gap. And that happens whenever there's a structural change. So the, the, the core bet that we're making here as, as framework developers is that 
the actual structure of UIs don't change very often. Uh, what, UIs tend to be very dynamic in that there are lots of values changing all the time, but the actual structure doesn't change all that often. And when it does, it's usually a big change. So it comes in big chunks, and then paying the cost of moving the gap at that time is worth it. And so that's sort of the key trade-off here that we're making. So let's go ahead and look at what this, what this works out to be in practice. So here we have this composable function, which is just a counter. And uh, let's see what the compiler does when, when it encounters this function. So if we desugar this a little bit, what the add composable annotation means is that we're going to add this synthetic parameter here, uh, which I've, I've named as a composer. And we're also going to insert uh, composer start and end calls in, in the function. And you can see here that there are these uh, key inter integers that get passed in. And we're, we're also passing in these seemingly magic inter integers to the other composable function calls, which in this case are state and button. And the way to think about these integers, they're, they're generated by the compiler, uh, but basically you want to think of it as a unique, uh, unique identifier for that call site. And so one possible implementation would be to just take a, a hash of the source position um, that, that, that that call site is at. Additionally, what we're doing is we're passing in the composer object that was passed to us. We're passing that in to all of the other composable functions that are in, in our body. So let's go over and look and see how this, this function with this new compiled code interacts with the slot table. So the first thing that we do is we hit this composer.start. And with that, what we do is we insert a group into the slot table. And that group has the, the key that was passed into that function. And then we move on, we go to the, the call to state. And state is also a composable function, and it's also going to insert its own group. And then the implementation of state is going to store a state instance into the slot table as well, and then return it. And then we run into button, and button is going to insert its own group. And each of the parameters that we pass to button are going to be stored in the slot table as well. And then button itself might have uh, its own implementation that itself uh, utilizes the slot table in some way. So I'm representing that here. And then now we're done executing this function, and our slot table is filled. So let's look at this. We, we basically see that there is some section of the slot table that is allocated towards the, the call to state. And there's another section that's allocated towards the, the call to button. And we can see that overall, the, this section here is allocated towards the call to counter. So this linear representation uh, in the slot table is sort of like a depth-first traversal of the composable call graph. And we might look at this and we say, OK, we're inserting an awful lot of these groups here. And what are they actually used for? And so the groups are needed to do structural modifications, like we talked about. Um, but structural modifications only happen if you have essentially conditional logic or some sort of control flow that could cause changes as, as executions go on. But it turns out that we're a compiler, so we can actually know statically when a certain composable call might happen conditionally. And, and, and that's most of the time not going to be the case. So actually, we can elide these groups in, most of the time. And that really limits the, the amount of space that uh, we take up in the slot table, and so that's a good thing. But let's look at an example where we do need the groups. In this case, we have this app composable that goes and fetches some data somewhere. And the, the result of that is either null or, or not. If it's null, we're going to show some sort of a loading screen. And if it's, if it's not null, then we'll render this header and body as a result. So when we desugar this code, it, it might look something like this. And we see here that <clears throat> instead of passing the key through the composable calls, what we're able to do is we're just able to insert groups around control flow, in this case, the if statement. And so we have, we have a different group for each branch. 
So now let's imagine that we're executing this function, and the first time we execute it, get data returns null. And so that means that we're going to go down the first branch uh, of this function, and so we'll insert a group with key one, two, three, and then we'll call loading, and then we're done. So the next time that app gets called, let's imagine that result now returns something non-null. So we're going to go down a different path. We're going to go down the latter branch. And this is where the interesting thing happens. So here we, we're calling composer.start with, with key 456. And what the runtime is going to do is it's going to look at that, and it's going to compare it with the current group, which is 1, 2, 3. And it's going to see that it's changed. And so that lets the runtime know that a structural change is happening. And so what it needs to do is it needs to first move the gap to the current position, and then wipe away all of the, all of the data that was in the current group, and then essentially continue execution as normal. <clears throat> and so what we see here is that one of the ways to interpret this is that the overhead of the if statement in Compose is a single entry in the slot table. And what this allows us to do is have a backing cache, which is the slot table, that has its current index guaranteed to be at the, the same point of execution every time it is there. And that actually ends up being a really powerful tool. And so we utilize this to create what, what we call positional memoization. And memoization is, is sort of like a, a fancy word for um, essentially caching the result of a function based on the inputs of that function. And so to, to give an example of something closely, more closely related to that, let's consider this example, where here we have this composable function, and inside of it, we're, we're doing a calculation. We're, we're taking in uh, these, the items and the query string that was passed to us, and then we're filtering it based on that, that query string somehow. So this is a, a CPU-intensive operation. And one of the things that we could do is we could wrap it with this call to remember and remember here is a composable function that um, essentially memoizes something. So if we go through and look at how this would work, we, we make this call to remember. And the first argument is items. And the first time we're executing this code, we're going to store the, the parameters that were passed to us. So we're going to store items in the slot table. And we're going to store the query in the slot table. And since this is the first time we're executing, we, we don't know what the result of the calculation is. So we go ahead and run the calculation. And then we're going to store the result of that calculation as well, and then return it. So at this point, nothing really that special happened. But the next time we execute this function, something interesting takes place. So here we have a, a call to remember again, and we have a populated slot table. And let's assume that items and query haven't changed. So what Remember is going to do is it's going to look at items. It's going to compare it with the previous version. And, if it and then it's going to move forward, and it's going to compare query with the previous version of query. If both of those parameters compared equal to the previous version, then the entire calculation gets skipped. And we just return the result that was stored in the slot table. And this is essentially what memoization is, except memoization usually happens in a global scope, whereas this is more of a local scope, where we have a single shallow cache that is local to its position in the call graph. <clears throat> so the signature to remember might look something like this. And if you look at it, there's a pretty interesting degenerate case, which is where there are no inputs. So in this case, we can imagine kind of this weird example where we take remember, and the calculation that we're remembering here is a call to math.random. And math.random is an inherently impure function. And so with a global memoization strategy, this would kind of be nonsensical. There'd be no reason to do it. But here it actually takes on a, a new meaning. Um, in this case, x is going to have a unique value for every execution of example that happens at that position. But if we use example multiple times in our hierarchy, each version of example that we use is going to have its own answer for what x is. 
And so you can think of this as basically a type of persistence that we've created. And the really interesting thing is that this persistence gives rise to what, what we would think of as state. And so the state function that we were using earlier, it's actually a utility method around remember, where we're just remembering the allocation of a state instance. <clears throat> so that brings us to recomposition. And <clears throat> uh, I mentioned earlier that composable functions have this ability to, to reinvoke themselves at any time. And so I want to go over exactly how, how that works and, and why we would do that. So here we have our same counter example. And in this case, what happens is uh, we first call state, and state returns us this new instance of a state object. And the state class is annotated with at model. And what at model essentially means in, in this context is it, it's a special class where Compose can observe reads and writes to the properties of that class. So what's going to happen is as we execute counter, if we see that anyone makes a read to a model instance during the execution of the function, what we can do is we can automatically subscribe counter to writes to that object. And so when someone writes to that object, we can schedule a recomposition, which will cause counter to get composed again. And so you can see here in the on press of button, we, we write to the state variable. And so that sounds all well and good, but how do we actually do this? And so if we look at what the compiler is doing, when we desugar this function again, we're going to call start and end, just like we did before. But this time, we're going to add this code to our end call. And what we're doing here is composer.end is, is optionally returning some value. And it would return null in the case where no model object was read during the execution of it. Because if we know for sure that there's no way that this composable would ever get recomposed, then there's no reason for us to spend time teaching the, the runtime how to recompose it. So if composer.end is non-null, we, we end up calling this update scope function. And we pass it a lambda. And that lambda is basically just calling counter again. And this time, it's calling it with a new composer. And that composer is understood to ha be, have the right current index so that when it recomposes, it does so properly. And so whenever we talk about a composable recomposing, what's really happening is this lambda is getting called. And so we can leverage this capability to do some pretty interesting things. Here's a, an example bind method that, that we might write uh, today in the current UI, UI toolkit for Android. Uh, in this case, what we're doing is we have a function that, that receives a live data instance of messages. And what we want to do is we want to make our UI reactive to, to changes to that messages. So what we do is we observe that live data instance. We pass it a lifecycle owner and then a lambda. And that lambda is going to get invoked every time messages changes. And so to write this in the lambda, we have to then in, inside that lambda go and update our, our UI. With Compose, we can do something a little bit different. We can kind of invert this relationship a little bit. So we can have a similar function where, where we have a composable and it accepts this live data. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to call a different observe method. This one is a composable observe method. And this is going to do two things. So one, it's going to return the current value of live messages. And then the other thing it's going to do is it's going to subscribe that composable to updates to, to that live data instance. And so instead of passing a lifecycle owner and a lambda that updates uh, or, or that runs every time every time the live data changes, what we're doing is we're leveraging the fact that composables are restartable and just saying, we'll restart this composable every time it changes. And so if we wanted to implement that observe function, it might look something like this. So just like before, we're creating this state variable, and we're calling it result. And then we're returning from that function the value of that, uh, of that state variable. <clears throat> 
And then what we're doing is we're calling this on commit composable. And what this is, is this is a way to run work whenever Compose has, has made a change if something else has changed. And so in this case, we're passing in the live data instance. So we're saying, run this work for every live data instance that this function gets called with. And so the work that we're doing is we're building an observer. And that observer is going to mutate the state variable that we had created whenever, uh, whenever it gets called. And then we're observing uh, the live data instance that we're operating on. And then the final thing we do is we call this onDispose method. And that essentially does a teardown of everything that we set up in the onCommit. And so this will get called whenever Compose knows that it no longer needs uh, to, to use this function. And so in this case, we're, we're removing our observer and cleaning up after ourselves. And so this type of pattern you could use to have Compose interop with any sort of state management or, or reactive library that, uh, that you're using. This is kind of how you could achieve that interop. OK, so let's talk a little bit about some performance optimizations that we can do. <clears throat> Here's an example of, of uh, some simple composables. Uh, in this case, we have this Google composable, which renders an address form. And uh, we render some text nodes with that address. It's a simple example, but let's look at what happens to the slot table when we do this. So in this case, we're storing all of the parameters to, the, to these composable calls in the slot table. And we can see that there's actually a little bit of redundancy. Here we have Mountain View and CA that is, is stored up top from the call to address, and then stored again later down, down the, the call graph to call text. And so <clears throat> we want to try and get rid of some of this redundancy. And it turns out that since we have a lot of static understanding, we can get rid of a lot of this. So let's imagine that we have this Google composable. And in addition to the composer parameter that we're inserting, we also add this static parameter. And what it is is an integer bit field. And what the bit field represents is for each bit, it's essentially a flag indicating whether or not the parameter at that index the runtime has deemed will never be different it will be static for, for as long as this function executes. And so we can do some interesting things here. We see that the, the last four arguments to address are static. We're, we're rendering string literals here. So those are always going to be static. And then the first parameter, number, it's going to be static if my parent told me that it was static. So if we go down into address and we do the same thing, we can see that we can add some somewhat non-trivial Boolean logic to each, each of these text calls. And understanding this logic is not important. It's not the point. This is the type of thing that compilers are really, really good at. It's this tedious, deterministic logic that humans don't need to read. So we're doing it at compile time, and you don't need to worry about it. So if we go back to our original example, we can see that we had these this redundant Mountain View and CA stored. And we, so we can get rid of that. And then we see that all of the remaining strings that were stored, those are actually static. They're string literals. So we can get rid of those as well. So that means that this entire hierarchy, the only thing that we need to store is the number parameter. And so then if we go into, into the Google Composable, what we see is that since number is the only thing that we need to check, we could actually generate code that checks it ahead of time. And if it hasn't changed, it can kind of know that, well, I don't need to call address at all. And we can just skip the execution of address altogether. So this is a pretty significant thing. What this means is that I could write a composable call, and the compiler is going to generate code that may not call it every time that code is executed. And so that's a pretty big semantic leap. And so I want to talk about a, a computer science um, concept that this is related to. And it's called referential transparency. And this is sort of a, a big sounding word, but 
most of you actually have probably already taken advantage of this fact if you've ever taken a basic algebra course. And so if we want to understand this better, what referential transparency means is that when I look at this mathematical expression here, what I see is, OK, I, I'm, I'm calculating 3 squared and 4 squared. And I know that that is equal to 9 and 16, respectively. So I can, in my head, replace that expression with just those constants. And then I know that 9 plus 16 is equal to 25. So in my head, I'm going to replace that with 25. And then I know that the square root of 25 is 5, so I'm going to replace that with 5. And so what we've done is we've, in our heads, simplified something more complex by essentially leveraging the fact that mathematical functions are referentially transparent. So it means I can replace the result with the expression itself without changing the behavior of the program. And so the ingredients for something to be referentially transparent is that the function is pure and it has no side effects. And so what I mean by pure is that given the same inputs, it has the same output. And by no, no side effects, I essentially mean that there are no shared mutations, no observable mutations outside of the scope of the function. And so then we can ask the question, are composable functions pure and side effect free? No, <laughs> not at all. Uh, but actually, if you squint just right, there's, there's some interesting facts that we can take advantage of here. And so I, I, I was not completely upfront with you with how Compose worked in some of the previous slides. And that was just to simplify things. But the truth is, is that when we pass in the composer to a composable function, uh, it's actually read only. And so all of the things I was talking about where we're updating the value of the slot table, uh, those side effects actually are stored in the composer as a change set to be applied later. And so what this means is that in some ways, composable functions share a lot of the, the same advantages that referentially transparent functions have. And this allows us to do some interesting things. But basically what it means is that we can have a loose guarantee that the call to header up here is not going to affect the call to item or to footer. And so these operate independently. And, and what, what this allows us to do is that in some, in some cases, the Compose compiler may deem a function skippable. And it may generate code that will skip that function during the execution of your call graph when it deems it to be safe. And in addition to that, what it means is that we can actually run the execution of some of these functions on different threads and run them in parallel and concurrent with one another. Because the composer that we're passing in is read-only. We're not making any changes to it. And so it's thread-safe to do so. Now, this isn't how Compose works today. Th this is a capability that Compose has, but this is something that we're working on very hard to make this a reality. And a lot of the design decisions that we've uh, made with the Compose runtime have been to, uh, directly to achieve this goal. And so a lot of the decisions we've made have been in that vein. OK, so I, I wanted to just end with a couple of closing thoughts here. So it's an interesting question to ask. Is Compose a UI library, or is it something a little bit more? Um, and one of the ways I like to think about Compose is Compose is a UI library that's built on top of a draft language feature proposal that is the Compose compiler and the at Composable annotation. And I, I think that the way we're doing things here, it's completely agnostic to UI. And there's some inter interesting... Um, basically implementations that, that might be related to incremental computation uh, and some other things that you might be able to do. And so I guess I, I'd like to just sort of leave this talk today with um, kind of a, a challenge for, for you all is to uh, kind of think about what else we could apply such a system like this to and have a, a compiler that, that sort of advantage, uh, that really aggressively optimizes these, these very large declarative call graphs. Uh, additionally, I just wanted to emphasize again how early this is and how there are a lot of things that are still in progress that we're still working on. Uh, and so Compose, 
while it's interesting to talk about and to play with, um, we really do not want you to be shipping production apps right now. There is a lot of changes that we're making. And then finally, uh, if, if this is something that interests you, um, please come join the conversation. We, we actually are uh, pretty active in the Compose channel on the Slack, uh, on the Kotlin Lang Slack. And so I would encourage any of you to, to come and um, talk with us ab about certain things. I'm personally pretty active there, and a lot of the rest of the team is as well. Anyway, that's all I have. Thank you.